So uh, I've got a number of beautiful questions here. I've done my best to kind of group some of them together as a number of people were asking similar questions from their unique perspective. So hopefully I can get the greatest representation of this room's questions possible to you. And you can offer fully satisfying answers that will Easy. completely... Easy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want to start... Uh, most of the questions really have encouraged me because they have to do with people doing some honest wrestling or loving those doing honest wrestling and trying to figure out how do I put one foot in front of the other on the way to Jesus in the midst of what I'm carrying. But I want to start with you defined belief for us in a really beautiful biblical way of being not just an intellectual thing, but an active thing. And so one question is, how do you actively practice belief when you are intellectually wrestling with belief? Is there a chicken and the egg? Do you try to solve one before the other? Do you just proceed blindly? Uh, kind of, what would you say to that? Well, this answer is going to sound uh, maybe tactile to a fault, but I would defer to the great theologian Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, <laughs> who's a hero of mine for obvious reasons. Um, in Arnold's uh, Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, in the opening introduction, this is a real answer, I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> In the opening pages of his introduction, really fascinating stuff, uh, Arnold writes about discipline um, in a, I think, probably accidentally theologically robust way. And he talks about discipline as something that kind of accumulates into itself and says that, you know, like few people are motivated from that, even people who take up like, uh, you know, a sport like bodybuilding. Rarely do they have all the discipline necessary to go as far as he's taken something like that from the outset. And this to Arnold is unconcerning because he says, once you take up a certain amount of practice, that small gesture of discipline creates new desire for more discipline. And I have found over time that I, I realize this sounds like a, a, you know, oh, just get over it and do it kind of answer. But honestly, experientially, I have found that when I enact small gestures of um, disciplined faithfulness, and by that I mean time in the morning with the scriptures, the basic stuff that you all learn going to church and that we, you talk about at Bridgetown all the time, um, it creates a desire for more of those same things. Um, something, a practice, even a practice as alienating as something like silence and solitude or fasting, for example, that feels as if for those of us who are not accustomed to those, not rhythmically, not at all, um, I have heard so many stories of people from my own church who were like, man, I did not want to do fasting when we took up this thing. And then, lo and behold, like I found this incredible benefit from the practice of fasting, from the practice of silence and solitude. And now I'm surprising myself by marking a day on my calendar, which I would like to do that again. So I think that in the same way that anyone who takes up a disciplined lifestyle, whether it's, you know, bodybuilding or kung fu or, you know, the blah, 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 metaphors, metaphors. But we find that stepping into and practicing even when we don't initially feel like creates more desire to it and teaches us what it means to practice when we don't want to practice. And that doesn't mean that you'll never waver in your commitment to discipline faithfulness, but I find that, you know, I said earlier in the talk that like the fitness enthusiast learns what it means to work out even when they don't feel like working out. Part of what it means to live faithfulness is to enact disciplines of faithfulness and a lifestyle of faithfulness without waiting for you know, a spark of desire to do it all the time. If you wait around waiting for the day when you want to fast, you'll probably fast zero days. Um, but if you teach yourself what it means to, you will teach yourself the desire for more faithfulness. So my advice personally from my own experience is just, you know, what about Bob? Baby steps. Baby steps, get on the bus. Like baby steps, get up tomorrow and spend 10 minutes in the scriptures and see if that makes you want to spend 10 more. Scriptures just continue to enact rhythms that create more rhythms. I think is one great way to start discipline faithfulness. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, you've read Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. You haven't read that thing? Man. <laughs> wow. I mean this in just the most honest way. You just don't look like a guy <laughs> who would have... It's not supposed to be. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Um, we, we live in a cynical culture and a particular cynical city within that culture. Cynicism is the waters that the vast majority of us are swimming in and we're not immune to the environment. Even as you were talking about a community of belief, regardless of what that belief is, we all live in a community of cynicism and that influences us. So what are some tools or habits or thoughts you have about combating cynicism that might enable us to more readily participate in Orthodox Christian community? Well, I can answer this as a, a sympathizer, not just geographically, but by disposition. I am cynical to a fault. Um, and this is not, uh, this is uh, a down my own, per, to my own personal detriment. I like cynicism left to my own devices, meaning it scratches some kind of um, carnal itch in me. P pessimism, cynicism, I'm drawn to that way of thinking and left to my own devices, I'll kind of revel in, in those like mental circles and do, doing laps and everything's terrible and I'm, ter you know, that kind of thing. At first to be funny and sardonic and then eventually to the corrosion of my soul. So I, I really get it. Um, <laughs> And, and it doesn't help that we live in the Portland metro area in which that's kind of air that, the air that we breathe and, you know, globalism hasn't helped bringing, social media brings that to us one way or, or another. Uh, and so as someone who's drawn to that way of thinking and um, to a fault in my, what we would call the flesh, drawn to that way of seeing the world, um, I have learned that I have to constantly go against my own wiring to order my thinking and environment in such a way that will contribute to faithfulness rather than faithlessness. Meaning that, you know, I would love to just, uh, I don't watch a lot of TV shows, but um, one that I will because of this wiring thing is, man, I'll just watch any Black Mirror, all Black Mirror all the time. And then after Black Mirror is over, I go, yeah, man, the world is terrible. And, you know, it scratches that itch in me. Um, and I won't, by default, because of my wiring, go, you know what, I'd like to just put on worship record and just sit and bask in the glow of this worship record. So I have taught myself to go against my natural kind of innate, innate gravitational pull and be like, what I need, honestly, is to sit in the presence of this worship record. I need to do something that feels, quote unquote, unnatural to me, which is I don't, by default, want to just sit in my office and sing worship songs and lift my hands up, but I did that this morning. And it was, uh, it was like medicine to my soul because I was feeling cynical and, and pulled down. And I think uh, the mistake that I've often made is thinking like, well, God will meet me in my wiring and he will, but he won't ask me to go against it. And spoiler alert, he will all the time, <laughs> con constantly ask you to go against it. So, you know, I've, I've gone from a person who years ago would kind of like cross his arms in worship and engage in my own personal way, you know, um, so, uh, to someone that's like that. God is asking me to do something that doesn't come naturally to me, which is to engage him in a way that's more exuberant and expressive, and he meets me there in a way that's healing and restorative to my soul. So I think that given where we live and given the time in which we live, it's not enough to just think, you know, like, oh, well, you know, I got church, I got community, and then l allow the tidal wave of the Portland narrative to just wash over. You have to do overtime work to immerse yourself in the things of Jesus all day, every day. And you can do that. I mean, you have so many resources to be able to do it. You can listen to worship music or Bible Project podcasts. You can, want, you know, like listen to podcasts from a different church, from your church. You can um, go out of your way to have coffee and pray with a friend and talk about where your spirituality is going and your, your season of discipleship. And I think personally that you have to do that stuff just to be able to meet the pressure of the world in which we live, let alone come against and over it and overpower it. And that's the work that it takes. It's not an easy thing, but it can be done. Yeah, and, and just if I could add, you know, I think the desire that we're talking about some for, because someone may be thinking, all of that's great, but where do you get desire to sit in your office and raise your hands and worship if you're feeling cynical? To return to your bodybuilding metaphor, someone cultivates desire 
to do whatever you need to do to become a bodybuilder, which you know a lot more about than me. Clearly. Then, then it's because you want to look like a bodybuilder. You want to excel at that. And to me, desire has to start with looking at Jesus and saying, I want to look like Jesus. I don't understand everything the scripture teaches. I don't understand how fasting is going to help me get there. But I do understand this, that I want to look like that. And he is prescribing this to me. Mm -hmm. So I'll give it a shot. And, yeah, and exactly. I think that's a good place to start if you're looking for desire. Is there a more compelling person to be shaped into than Jesus of Nazareth? And I've not found one yet. Um, ne next question. What about if um, you are, I, you know, I don't want to misuse the word deconstructing, but maybe recovering from an authoritarian church environment? where church leadership was wielded in a way that was legitimately painful and unhealthy, then how do you recover from that in order to re-engage in church community again and learn to trust those in leadership within a church community again? That's a great question. And honestly, you know, my, the first, I don't know, 18 years of my church experience in life weren't great, quite frankly. Um, and now enough time has passed that I'm able to kind of look back over the timeline of my church upbringing and say like, oh, actually this, this aspect was pretty beautiful and I learned this um, because for a long time I saw it all as toxic and unhelpful and unhealthy. But quite frankly, and I think that I'm being pretty fair and pretty honest before God, a lot of it was, it was pretty bad, pretty damaging. Um, and it took me a long time to work it out. So I understand, and I understand, uh, you guys know as well as anyone, that um, church has people in it, people are broken, and so people will be hurt in church environments. Um, what I have found the, as the only answer to this question, again, and, and experientially, not just theoretically, is more church, which I know is a, a really um, frustrating answer to hear. And, and by this, I mean, here's my, my story in a microcosm. Like, so I had this bad church experience uh, and upbringing and spent years away from the church. Um, the church in particular was a big part of my deconstruction and that like I had that kind of, I'm not convinced that church is ever a good thing for a long time and still wanted some semblance of Jesus in the New Testament but couldn't wrap my head around church. And um, I don't know, some 12 or 13 years ago, my wife and I moved to the Pacific Northwest and one thing that we had con convinced one, ourselves and one another is that we wanted to give church another shot, showed up to Bridgetown, which was then Solid Rock downtown. And, uh, and I was so immediately struck by the beauty of church, not like, oh, I walked in the door and, wow, it's so, because the band did sound really good and I was pretty impressed by all that stuff. Wow, it's really big and the band sounds good. Um, but just immediately, you know, we made, a, we made a promise to one another and said, let's just really try. And let's say as much as it depends on us, we'll be here, we'll be present, we'll show up, we'll vacuum the floors, we'll go to the, you know, uh, house church, all that stuff. And we did, and I found right away, still not perfect, by the way, really messed up people at church all around us. And we were hurt almost immediately, and we hurt, like I've hurt so many people at church, not just as a leader, but just as a participant in the family of God. But I also just found like so much, like there's people who are really trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. And the leaders here are really trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. And I would sit with other people that were part of the church family that would, um, uh, and I, you know, not to be mean-spirited, but kind of nitpicking church and saying like, well, I don't like how they do this and I don't like this. And this one leader said this one thing to me. And part of me became immediately defensive for the church because I felt as if like, man, you don't know how good you have it. Like, some of us have been really, really hurt by terrible experiences. And um, the best that you can do is find a place where broken people are just trying to figure out how to follow Jesus together and doing the best they can and making mistakes together, all of them from the top levels of leadership all the way down, but repenting and holding one another accountable. And I have become convinced, not just from this church and my church, but from like traveling now and visiting all kinds of other different churches, there are lots and lots of churches really trying to do that here, around the world, they're, they're really all over the place. I think that I bought into a narrative that's like, 
easy to kind of narrow a social media perspective or what would have been then at the time just my anecdotal evidence into like, man, church seems really messed up because of this access to I have to a certain narrative, but it just doesn't hold up to experience and to the truth of the community of God, the family of God flourishing around the world. So I do understand that you can be hurt by church and there is a time and a place to step out of a community and to go somewhere else. But that's, I think, the key is to heal, move on and heal within the church rather than outside of it. And then one more question. Um, There were a number of folks asking questions about how can I be helpful to someone else who's in the midst of some type of deconstruction, wrestle with doubt, questioning, maybe quickly or slowly walking away from the church. How can I be helpful to that person, whether that person is an adult child or a friend or a family member? What is helpful? When is it helpful to say something? And what is helpful to say? So on and so forth. Yeah, this is the the million dollar question and the question that uh, I think maybe I've been asked the most, especially because, you know, I read this thing that's all about like my story of deconstruction. So people have said, what would have been helpful for you? And I think personally that um, the question or the answer rather is frustrating because um, it's semi shapeless. It really depends on the person. I think that my best advice is to hold two things together constantly in tension. And one of those is to be like an empathetic, faithful presence in a person's life um, that does not necessarily rush to, oh, we can resolve these, I have answers for you, here's this, read this book, listen to this podcast. I mean, there's a time and a place for those things and they can be really helpful. But to not kind of look at it like it's an issue to be resolved with immediacy per se, Um, But to be able to sit with someone and be like, it sounds like it sucks. It sounds like that's really hard. It sounds like you're hurting. I don't like that you're hurting. Um, But then the other dimension to that is to hold strong to your faithfulness and vulnerability that it's hard for you too, but to be like, but I am following Jesus and I'm going to follow Jesus. I think that in my experience, um, a tremendous amount of very well-meaning, loving people who cared for me Um, came at me with one or the other, meaning they came and said like, oh, well, you're hung up on this? Here's a sermon. Listen to the sermon. It'll resolve your problem. Or you're hung up on this? There's an answer to that. Look, just read this text with me. We'll figure it out. Um, And some of that, quite frankly, was helpful over time, but it wasn't the silver bullet. Or the other thing would be just like, look, dude, just get more faith. You know, get more faith and white knuckle it and let's go. Um, Instead of being like, yeah, it sounds like it's really hard, Um, and I won't wallow in it with you, but I will sit with you with empathy and kindness and compassion. If you want to talk about answers, we can go looking for answers together all day long. If you want to tell me about your pain, I can, I can handle hearing about your pain. Um, but I'm going to follow Jesus faithfully and I'll walk with you. I'll walk beside you or I'll go follow Jesus. Like, um, you know, come hell or high water. I think that faithfulness and compassion and empathy in the same place tailored to a person's unique wiring. I mean, you, you probably know those close to you in a way that uh, accommodates when they need either thing. Um, and, if, and if not, the Holy Spirit can give those the answers to you in the moment. Thank you. Thank you for making your life and your own journey a matter of public consumption. <laughs> that sincerely, that we might and we're just a small portion of people that are benefiting from your vulnerability. Uh, So thank you so much. And thank you for using the gifts that you've cultivated uh, to speak to such an important issue. You're a brilliant poetic writer. And so to have words like yours put to something as visceral as doubt is so helpful. And on a, on a personal level, thank you for your faithfulness to this church, even through a leadership transition. Thank you for getting to know me and welcoming me in and welcoming me into your life yeah. and remaining committed to doing church together in this area that we get to call home. Yeah, man, really absolutely. grateful.